Hello and welcome to Stratford Paddock. My name is Joe and this is a one-on-one -on -one interview. I'm joined by sports broadcaster Ben Jacobs and we're going to be talking about Manchester United's ownership. Ben, first of all, how are you doing? Very well. I come to you live from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, great to have you on the show. Um, there's so much to talk about and, and obviously, you know, some of the news recently has been sort of the lack of updates almost. But let's start with, with, with Manchester United's takeover. Um, just in sort of broader terms, and I'll get into details of, of specifics, but what is the latest as you understand it as it stands with Manchester United's takeover? Yeah, I'll keep it brief because not a lot has moved. It's the same line that's frustrated Manchester United fans for quite some time, which is multiple parties are currently engaging with Rain Group and the Glazers with nobody given the green light. And maybe the only bit of new news that I reported about a week ago is that difference in narrative again. So the perspective of Sheikh Jassim and Sir Jim Ratcliffe is that they're ready to go and awaiting communication and they feel a little bit in limbo even though the process hasn't been paused. Whereas sources closer to the selling side are adamant that Qatar in particular are not yet ready from this legal and logistical point of view. Now that doesn't mean that Qatar have definitively won, but if Qatar are being waited for, it still tells you that they're very firmly in the race. So those are the kind of counter narratives at this point, and I think it's to be expected because naturally those on the selling side can't simply say everyone's ready to go and mm. we've not offered any communication. Otherwise, they're giving away the fact that maybe the Glazers haven't decided what they want to do yet, which is one very realistic possibility. And then on the flip side, the groups are never going to say, we're not yet ready, we're causing some form of delay, whether mm. that's Sir Jim Ratcliffe trying to work out the exact flexible structure that will get board approval, or whether that's Sheikh Jassim and this vehicle needing to be shaped a little bit more legally and logistically to then be in a position where it can actually buy Manchester United football club. So I think this is normal to have a little bit of silence because it's not become a takeover anymore that has that urgency to be done by the beginning of the window or during the window. If everyone understands now that no one knew should they come into Manchester United can influence this window, then annoyingly for fans, but perversely from a process point of view, the time scale is not as important now as it maybe was when the process first started because everything was about getting it done by the end of the season even before the end of the season and certainly for the window now that boat has passed you kind of have to just treat the season as is spend as we've seen manchester united do and when an owner if there is to be a change of ownership or control mm -hmm. comes in is less important in terms of a specific start date now than it was before and i think that's why the glazers are taking their time and that's why the groups are ultimately frustrated and waiting for that further bit of communication to find out what's next we see this a lot from from united and, and from the glazers in terms of when there's a big decision to be made it's very very rare that united do it in a fashion where you go wow that was wow, that was quick well you sorted that out quickly that's you know that's dealt with now it's almost always what seems like a sort of long drawn out process whether that be transfers whether that be the situation with mason greenwood that's been you know going for six months and, and you know a much larger you know in, in in terms of the total situation there and now with the ownership thing as well it's like in our heads it seemed as though that the, the start of the window was the aim and then that's been missed so now basically we've got another year almost to work on this just going back though to the point you made before about the, the this supposed potential hold up with the legal side of things with the Qatari bid. Just what do you have any more detail on that? Because as someone who's mm. sort of legally an idiot like me, what does that <laughs> mean? What What is this sort of the, the concept of that there? Well, when you go through any takeover, you would usually enter into a preferred bidder status or if it wasn't this type of tender, you'd be dealing with a club, entering into a period of exclusivity and doing your due diligence. And due diligence is kind of two way. And in the seller's mind, they have to be sure that who they are trying to do a transaction with is capable of following through. So to check that, it requires various things whether that is preemptive legwork to make sure that they're going to pass the owners and directors test, 
whether that is more clarity over the vehicle buying the club, whether that is more information about the directors that are going to be involved. And there's therefore quite a few aspects needed. And then you have to look into, is this person trying to buy the football club legally ready? And this is why over the course of the last weeks, we've seen things like holding companies appear. Mm. And you have to decide how you're actually going to transfer the funds. It's not just a case of like a shop purchase, congratulations, you've won the process to buy Manchester United. What's your credit card number and the three digits on the back? You, you need to determine what kind of transaction will take place. And there's various ways of doing it. Some that are more preferential to the buyer, some that are more preferential to the seller. So effectively, each round has had a so-called process letter within the bidding, and that defines the scope. And this is why I've reported, and I said so exclusively to begin with, that there would be no exclusivity Mm. to this point because the process letters, to my understanding, made it clear that no group in any of the stages would be put through to a period of exclusivity because maximum competitive tension was ultimately needed. So in those process letters, there are further guidelines about what is necessary from the groups, what they have to provide, whether that was the proof of funds early on, right through to now in terms of what they have to show to rain group in order to satisfy that financially they're not just capable but also logistically legally and in terms of personnel Mm. they are who they say they are effectively and this is where we have a slight conflict of narrative because Sheikh jassim are clear that they're a clean transaction that they're a cash bid that they are debt free that there is pledged investment and that if selected it will be very easy to move forwards whereas from the selling point of view they are still unsure as to who exactly will be listed as a director Mm. who exactly will undertake the premier league owners and directors test because this has always been just called qatar or sheikh jassim so Mm. who else where exactly is the source of funding and if we accepted them today Are they going to then populate that vehicle via the 9-2 foundation? And what will be the timescale for that type of transaction? And the changing of funds is usually one of the quicker things to do. It only takes two or three days once you get to the point of being able to acquire the football club. And it's kind of the last thing, certainly with the Newcastle takeover, the Chelsea takeover. It's the last thing that gets done because you're not going to transfer the funds until you know ultimately that you've done everything else in order to buy the football club. So I think that the seller's perspective is effectively that throughout this process, Qatar haven't necessarily been who they've said they've been. But the Qatar perspective is that they're still in the race Hmm. and they could have been kicked out at any time. And they've always seen that as telling and they could have gone with Jim Ratcliffe at any time. And they haven't ever put him in an exclusive period. So this is why Qatar are leaning towards we're either going to be told we've won or it's going to be some form of no outright sale. And that will either be because the Glazers want to put the club on the market at a future date when they think they'll get more interest and a higher number, or they're going to go for some kind of minority investment. So Jim Ratcliffe becomes the stalking horse, whereas the Jim Ratcliffe perspective is that he's a experienced negotiator that knows how to win at all costs which is why he's being so flexible and giving the opportunity to either go or stay and that's an important point that yes Ratcliffe is prepared to allow Joel and Avram Glazer to stay as one option with a kind of staggered or laddered exit but if they come to him and say we want you to buy all 69% of the shares he's also prepared to do that one as well. So Mm. that perspective is also different because Ratcliffe feels like he can play on the fact that the Glazers maybe are having doubts about going as a six and ultimately use that to create a point of difference between his bid and Ratcliffe's bid. And that for me is one of the most fascinating things throughout this whole process, that the Glazers want the highest price. Rain's sole job is to get the highest price. To get the highest price, you need competitive tension. 
And you, you have these two leading groups effectively saying there is no competitive tension because we're completely different. So one mm. source on the Qatar side calls the two bids like, quote, apples and pears. And then on the Ratcliffe side, sources again say, we're not trying to go head to head with Sheikh Jassim. We're trying to strike a deal with the Glazers. And if that means playing upon their desire to stay, we'll do that. So there's a lack of competitive tension and a lack of progress. And they're almost tied together because to get the progress, you need the competitive tension. And to get the competitive tension, you've ultimately needed a higher valuation. And to get the higher valuation, you need a higher volume of suitors. So this is why I think the Glazers are actually as frustrated as anyone else, because they've put this club on the market and they simply have never got as much interest as they first believed they would. Mm. It's quite a bizarre situation, although I suppose, you know, it seems like Jim Ratcliffe, like you said, is almost going for the more kind of like businessy approach where he's like you said playing on the technicalities of a deal rather than just you've got a thing that I want I'm going to buy it off you that seems you know the, the the Qatari bid seems a lot more straightforward and you know almost that's how I would imagine deals go where it's you have this thing I want it here's the money for that mm -hmm. thing and you give it to me whereas Jim Ratcliffe's is a lot more sort of nuanced and, and playing with emotion like you said of maybe they don't want to leave or maybe some do some don't and all that um you mentioned there about sort of, it seems as though perhaps Qatar feel that they, they are <clears throat> either about to win or that the, that the sale idea itself is about to change and become this minority thing. What, what do you think the latest of, of, of Jim Ratcliffe and his team are thinking? Do, do, do they still feel confident or does it seem as though, you know, if Qatar are thinking that they're going to win, presumably that means that Jim Ratcliffe doesn't or are they both just really confident somehow? No one's really confident. Both groups just feel okay. legally and logistically, and that is their perspective, that they're six foot from the finishing line. And yet, yeah. could their rival be six inches? And I've said that throughout the process. And I'll repeat it again. Because both groups are being forced or have been forced to undertake tasks traditionally associated with a preferred bidder, mm. it means that they're deep, deep in this process. And when you're deep in a takeover process, you would normally be the sole bidder and very often in exclusivity and that's why when you get asked to do a task of the nature of a preferred bidder it should be in your control and you should start to feel confident that you're going to win mm. but then you look around and you see that all the other groups are still in the race and that i think is why we're getting counter narratives that's why we're getting an oscillation of optimism from one group to the other group to neither group and that's why the Glazers have been able to frustrate through this process because they've never really shown their hand. And the only thing that is going to add clarity to the groups is communication where they're told categorically that they're the only one left in the race. And at this point, that's not the approach that the Glazers have wanted to take. I think the other thing that's worth just bearing in mind now in terms of time and why you might drag things out is that if there's deals there on the table and if the groups are prepared to be patient and effectively just wait and if the glazers belief is that with every hour day month season that they stay in charge the price is going to go up mm. and if this window doesn't matter anymore then what if and this is only analysis so i don't want to scaremonger here in what i'm saying but what if the glazers said we'll now aim to do a deal because it's best for transition in the summer of 2024 and by the summer of 2024 we are going to have another season of Champions League football another successful campaign under Eric Ten Hag Rasmus Hoyland has signed we're only one year away from the expanded Club World Cup Saudi Arabia will have had two years of spending money left right and south which is significant because they see a piggybacking element I think everyone thinks the Saudi Pro League is a threat to the Premier League and it sense but from a club perspective if you're Manchester United you're thinking the Saudis have got money so maybe we go over there for pre-season maybe there's a sponsorship deal that Riyadh Air have just sponsored Atletico Madrid even though they don't actually start their flights until 2025 so quite clearly you're looking at all that Saudi money and saying a club like Manchester United as a brand could also piggyback off that so maybe they feel like if the price at the moment is around 5 billion, some say slightly north of that, and the Glazers want 6 billion or more, then yeah. does another year 
whilst they continue negotiations, get them to that number as well. So that might be part of their thinking as well. I want to make it very clear again. I'm not saying it will be delayed until 2024. I'm yep. not scaremongering. I'm just saying if you're the Glazers and the season's already started and it goes well, you are just in a stronger position because you're then saying to the bidders, when you did all your due diligence, when you thought it was going to be done before a ball was kicked, you had this price. And now if the season starts positively and with all the signings that have been made, perhaps there is more indication the longer it takes that there'll be another season of Champions League and you can start yeah. to ask for more money because of that. So this is the challenge with a long takeover that if it doesn't get done within the time frame that everyone wanted, then the goalposts move. And this mm. is why most that want a takeover look at 49 Enterprises and Leeds United, even though they went down. This is why most that want a takeover or even minority investment like to get it done during the summer because that is the most stable time for mm. a transition. Yeah, and it's interesting, like almost once that deadline has passed, then why not push it to the next year? Like you said, like, it's, you know, if you get an extension on a, on a essay or something at school or you get an extra week all of a sudden you use that entire week because you might as well use the entire week now the now the window's passed now we're, now the season started i can i see your point maybe the glazers will think we might as well use this whole season to to let the value go up and um, just on that on that one point about the the fee around 5 billion i'm not sure if you saw this did you see this thing that the the cardiff chairman was saying the other day mm. did you see this uh, I'll just give you the yeah. quote for anyone at home who hasn't seen it. But he said, Manchester United are going to announce their sale at 7.2 to 7.3 billion, which is roughly 10 times their revenue. Now, he's talking about this in context of uh, about selling Cardiff and that sort of thing. But he said that he's got friends over in America. I've been meeting a lot with US private equity firms and the valuation of football clubs is going through the roof, sort of hinting at this inside knowledge on this deal. Do you think that was just a, a bloke kind of talking nonsense or you know using his, his his conversations that he's had that people are you know elevating things slightly or do you think there's something in that because not only why would he know the, the Cardiff chairman but also 7.2 billion pounds is far north of anything we've seen rumored do you think there's anything in that or it was just a, a bit of speculation from no, I think it was a throwaway comment I mean okay. I have respect for anyone's opinion and it may well be that he's got his own sources that tell him that there's going to be some movement but specifically on the price 7.2 7.3 billion would be not only sky high but as you say totally inconsistent mm -hmm. with the numbers that have been tabled so far and if somebody had made an offer of 7.2 to 7.3 billion then the manchester united takeover would be done there's no yeah. way on earth the Glazers wouldn't have accepted that offer. Because remember, the staying aspect is about not sentiment, but money. It's staying because they think that the business is going to grow. And yeah, from a personal point of view, if they stay, they want to be part of that success. But they are prepared to go. We've been told all along throughout the process by multiple sources that they're determined sellers. But, and this is the key point, at the right price. So if mm. 7 billion plus was tabled, there's no way that six glazers would reject that type of offer. And as you rightly say, it's 2.2 or 2.3 billion more than the ballpark that sources have intimated is on the table at the moment. And although there's some that say Qatar will always pay what it takes to win eventually, and maybe there's even surprise that they haven't done to date, the jump needed if either group just wanted to have it and table something that would guarantee it, the jump needed from where they are wouldn't be as high as 7.2 mm. to 7.3 billion. It might only be 6 billion. It would almost certainly be 6.5 billion. And it's obviously not business tactic because this is not a transfer to jump from 5 billion <laughs> to yeah. 7.2 billion. So in a transfer, we saw Arsenal go up by about 25 million to get Declan Rice. We saw Chelsea start at 60 million for Moises Caicedo and end up mm. paying 115 million. And you can do that in a transfer and you've got a very specific deadline because the window shuts. But as far as takeovers are concerned, these are billions, not millions. And mm. you would never ever in a million years jump from five odd billion to over seven billion 
you wouldn't need to and it would yeah. not be sensible business and if you did there, there would be significant alarm bells ringing so i think that the numbers are maybe not to be focused on because the comment was quite throwaway yeah and as far as whether there'll be an announcement i would again be cautious because we've heard all of this throughout the entire process that there's going to be announcement today tomorrow and maybe people that followed my reporting have also got irritated because it's been shot down quite consistently there won't be an announcement there won't be mm. an announcement there won't be exclusivity one day i'll be able to tell you there will be an announcement but i would urge caution because i don't think anybody has ever been right uh, no. about a specific prediction of when there'll be an announcement if you keep predicting one day you'll be right but yeah. I, I think we need to urge caution because it's such an important moment for manchester united that to be saying it's going to happen on a set day knowing that it hasn't in the past it creates a frenzy creates a stock market spike and so far has led to nothing yeah absolutely um Unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, it'll be good that we can get you on again. But unfortunately, this won't be the last time I'm sure we have you on speaking about this ownership thing because it doesn't seem like um, we're, we're, we're right at that end game just yet. And hopefully that can happen very soon. Um, let's move on to some transfers then because, you know, somewhere where there is actually a bit of movement, it seems. Harry Maguire to West Ham. Latest reports seem to suggest that that deal is now off. Um, what's your understanding of what's going on with that? I would say stall rather than off at the moment is a slightly more accurate way okay. of putting it. There is a possibility that a deal could be revived, but there is certainly uncertainty as things stand. And with Maguire, the factors at play are twofold. One is there has to be exit terms that need to be agreed to leave West Ham for a 30 million deal. And then two is just Maguire himself, because as I've reported many times before, the player spoke to Eric Ten Hag, had the captaincy removed, and it was indicated at that time that he was still quite important to Manchester United, just not as that regular starter or leader. So Maguire mm. left that talk feeling great respect for Manchester United, albeit disappointment that, as expected, his role would be diminished. So now he has to understand whether or not it's better for him to stay at Manchester United and be part of the project where he's settled and liked in the dressing room or go to a club like West Ham and play more regularly. And in playing more regularly, get perhaps a better chance of keeping his spot for Euro 2024. Because there is a chance, if Maguire's not playing at all, that someone like Levi Colwell could come in and supplant him. And Gareth Southgate has certainly given encouragement to Levi Colwell at Chelsea that that might be possible if he has a good season. So there's a few things in play here. But for now, I would say stalled. The, the thing about West Ham and transfers, more so than any other club, but we saw it with Manchester United and Mason Mount as well, is sometimes you get a quite clear, we might walk away, we have walked away, it will not happen. That was mm. the case with Mount. You may remember I exclusively reported that Manchester United would not walk away from Mason Mount. And then everyone else said in that 24 hours, Manchester United are looking at other targets. They might even focus on Caicedo. And I said, no, Manchester United will not walk away from Mason Mount because mm. that was clearly a game. West Ham said, we're walking away from James Ward-Prowse. They've just signed James Ward-Prowse. <laughs> but again, that was clearly a game. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's a game. And as a journalist, that scrutiny of sources is really important because you might get something from someone you know is in the room, but you still have to go to the other side and you still have to have that mm. scrutiny of sources because maybe, just maybe, it's part of a game. So at the moment, West Ham are saying that they're looking at other centre-back targets. So I would say that the move's in doubt. And if Maguire and Manchester United end up still being together when the window closes, then I don't think that Eric Ten Hag or Maguire will think that's a bad thing. But uh, Ham need a centre-back. And David Moyes feels like Maguire can bring that leadership and get that game time. So now we're just going to have to wait and see whether the deal can be revived. But as of now, I would say that it is stalled and it has taken a negative turn. Okay. Well, that's that's somewhat positive news. Then I think 
it's a deal that makes sense for United. It's a deal that makes sense for Maguire, I think. And I think, it make, I think it'd be good for West Ham as well. I think he's a, a player that would improve them. So hopefully that can still happen. Um, just moving on from that then, and I know a lot of the reporting has been United's need to start selling to, to, to buy any more players. But there's been reports about uh, Pavard and Amrabat as well. Um, what is your sort of understanding? We'll start with Pavard, who would be more of a sort of like for like replacement of, of Maguire if he was to leave. Is that the situation we need to let him go first? And, and where's United's contact with Pavard up to? Yeah, I, I think that the Pavard signing is unlikely to happen if Maguire stays at the football club. So we know that Pavard is really intent on the move. But first, Manchester United have to resolve the situation with Harry Maguire. Otherwise, they simply won't progress on that, as far as I'm aware, anyway. And Harry Maguire is thought to want about £7 million to leave Manchester United. And he knows also, and this is another factor, that he's going to be on less money at West Ham too. So mm. that is why I think there's a variety of complicated and moving parts here, some of which are financial as far as the Maguire situation is concerned. So Pavard is a possibility. The player would absolutely love the move but we have to understand where Maguire is going to progress to first. Otherwise, I don't think we'll see too much movement on Pavard. And okay. with Amrabat, the situation has obviously been quite long-standing. that Amrabat would like to move to Manchester United. And I think that people presumed that it would get done quite quickly immediately after Rasmus Hoyland joined because it would be the next focus. And it is true as well that Manchester United, in terms of their due diligence on this deal, did agree personal terms with Amrabat over a month ago. So it's all still relatively positive as far as Amrabat and Manchester United are concerned. I think people just feel like that deal has been more definite and locked in and done because there was maybe a incorrect sense of reporting being put out there that Manchester United had almost lined it all up and then we're just going to have to green light it within days of the Hoyland deal being done. But I think that there's always been a little bit more work on the Fiorentina side to do first. And ultimately, Manchester United, at the point when they were finalising Rasmus Hoyland, hadn't put in this offer that some had said was out there. They hadn't actually put the formal bid so there's still a process to be carried out there as far as Manchester United are concerned so why was there a process to be carried out because Fred had to go first and that's now happened we need to obviously understand the situation with Scott McTominay as well but uh, there's no doubt that Manchester United have had Amrabat on their list and there's no doubt that things have moved on that front it's just happening like a normal transfer should and I think that the media cycles have maybe accelerated the urgency around it when the reality of the situation is just that Manchester United have taken their time on it. Hmm. Do, you, do you see a situation where United sign both Amrabat and Pavard? Assuming we sell Maguire, obviously, that would have to be, happen to open the door for Pavard in the first place. Do you think we could sign both of them or do you think it's a sort of one or the other situation? I think that the defensive midfield is a priority and if Maguire goes and that good money is received, it's possible that two still come in for Manchester United. That would be the dream scenario. It's a lot more money than the so-called allocated budget that was set aside um, for this window in terms of what was spent. But this is ultimately the inflated and crazy summer market we're having. And if Manchester United can get in good income for outgoings, then there is no reason why they couldn't potentially get both over the line. And even if it's not both those players, both those positions, because if Maguire goes, they'll need a centre-back for sure. And again, defensive midfield is still another priority position. But I don't think there's panic from Eric Ten Hag and there is the January window as well. So uh, overall, if a few outgoings happen and even one more comes in, then with Anan Amount and Hoyland, I think that Eric Ten Hag, given the financial play, financial fair play restrictions, will, will be quite content with this window. Yeah, great. Well, hopefully United can um, get the deal sorted. It's good. It's good that you've. It seems like sometimes you read the press, and obviously that the, the part of the press's job is to 
drive excitement and interest in stories. But it's nice that you come on and sort of calm things down slightly. Like this, you know, the way that this Amrabat deal is going is typical and it makes sense and it's not a disaster. And the, the way the Maguire thing's going is typical and it kind of makes sense. Like some of these deals, we want as fans for them to happen instantly. And if they don't, then there must be a disaster. Something must have gone terribly wrong. But actually, this is sort of par for the course. And the way that these deals are going is, is quite sensible almost from Man United. And it's quite yeah. refreshing and, and uh, comforting to hear you say that. So thank you. <laughs> what I'd say as well is that this is the most frantic period of the window. Yeah. There's two really crazy periods of the window because the early part of the window is really just about your planning and who can you get in early and you know mm. about the targets and you know when the window is going to open and you work on them. Then you have a big push when teams urgently want a player for game one of the season. And that's why we've seen quite a lot of movement in and around week one of the Premier League. And then, of course, you have the close of the window. And at the close of the window, you get market movement and clubs have to show their hand. So maybe someone that you were told wasn't for sale is now for sale. Maybe someone gets their target and that means that a player at their club becomes for sale. Maybe someone drops their price because they realize they're not going to get a deal. So this is unpredictable all of a sudden simply because of the fact that your decision making is based on urgency and it's based on movement of other clubs and the games kind of disappear and that's why we have to strap in now between now and the close of the window because it is the most unpredictable time of an already unpredictable transfer window hmm. right well hopefully we'll hear from you again before the end of the window with updates on the glazers updates on transfers but that's going to be all from us thank you very much ben for coming on uh, make sure you check out ben of course covering uh, the opening week of the saudi Premier League out there in Saudi. Thank you very much for coming on, Ben. Absolute pleasure. We'll speak soon. Thank you very much. Right, that's going to be all from us. Hit subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below to this video. Updates on the takeover, updates on transfers as well. This has been a one-on-one -on -one interview with Ben Jacobs. We'll see you in a bit.